Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We have people logging in from all across the globe. Thank you so much for joining this session hosted by Bero. Uh, my name is uh, Shakti Prasad. I am the head of content at Bero, and I run the Procurement Espresso magazine. I welcome you all to the fifth edition of Espresso Live event, an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and practitioners. Uh, before I get started with the session, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind. Yeah, all the participants will be on listen-only mode uh, for the entire duration of the webinar. We will be taking up the questions uh, at the end of the presentation, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session. Uh, Please type them into the question box given in your control panel. There could be a lag of a few seconds uh, in between the transition of slides, uh, so please bear with us. Uh, if you have any difficulty uh, in joining the webinar, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the Q&A box and we will try to help you. Now, I am happy to introduce Velkumar Krishnan the vice president of research at Bero. I hope you all can uh, see him on your screens. Uh, Vail is a, is a veteran in procurement intelligence space with over 15 years of experience. And over all these years, uh, he has worked on nearly 10,000 projects across industries, domains, and categories. He considers himself uh, to be a specialist in the oil and gas sector. And he has spent a number of years delivering high quality research to many of our marquee clients. Uh, recently, he's been uh, showcasing Barrow's new procurement intelligence platform, uh, BarrowLive.ai, uh, to hundreds of our clients and prospects, at times uh, making presentations even as late as uh, 1 a.m. or as early as uh, 5 a.m. Uh, needless to say, uh, Whale and his team are instrumental in building our uh, next-gen procurement intel platform. Well, uh, to cut a long story short, Whale is in love with procurement intelligence, period. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining the session today, Whale. Thanks, uh, thanks, Shakti. It's an absolute pleasure. And then good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be connecting with all of you through this webinar. Looking forward to the next uh, 57 minutes. So thank you again. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, thank you, Vail. Like all of you, I'm also eager to decode uh, the procurement beige book as to what it all means for us. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what is procurement beige book? Basically, it provides a snapshot of uh, current conditions uh, that are prevailing in uh, each of your categories. Uh, the report will show whether the conditions are uh, favorable, unfavorable, or neutral for uh, your procurement teams, or whether it's neutral for you as a category manager. Uh, in all uh, 389 categories uh, were studied for this particular report, and dashboards are available for 334 categories. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. A uh, whale. Well, uh, so, can you explain the research methodology, uh, the kind of input that has gone into preparing this report? Absolutely, absolutely. It'd be an absolute pleasure to do that, uh, Shakti, and uh, welcome everyone again. Um, so, Shakti, one of the things which we first did was to make sure that we cover all the industries out there, right? So, you've got you've got about 20 to 25 key industries out there with multiple spend categories mapped into each one of them. So the first step which we had to keep in mind was to ensure that there is good coverage of all the leading industries in the world, right? So what we did was we basically took all the NAICS codes or what is popularly called as the NAICS codes and we took all the UNSPSC, SIC, HS codes, pretty much most of the category codes based on the most popular taxonomies used in a spend cube and what we did was we mapped them into three different levels, right? 
you can more popularly call them as the L1, the L2, and the L3 level. The L1 level would be the broadest level. You can actually call it a cluster. A typical example would be um, chemicals, for example, right? Another, um, uh, another example would be employee benefits. Another example would be freight, right? So you could call them a super category. So we took them, placed them at the top of the pyramid and called them the clusters. And then in the middle band, we built out what we call as the portfolios. Just as an example, a portfolio in chemicals would be elastomers or more popularly your natural rubber, or you could have industrial acids, um, which would actually encompass, for example, a sulfuric acid. So we laid out all the portfolios or more popularly what are called as your L2 categories. And then at the bottom, which is basically the part which is closer to the ground, which is the bottom of the pyramid, we built out all the 389 categories, right? So just to recap, 19 clusters, 53 portfolios, 389 categories. And the 389 categories are again built by thousands of subcategories, but we didn't go to that level just to make sure that we don't go to microcosm. So we built it across these three okay. levels. Yeah, so the way you need to look at it as a bunch of related categories make up a portfolio, a bunch of related portfolios make up a cluster all okay. of the clusters portfolios and categories map into about 25 30 different industries based on category taxonomy so you understand what the relationship on price and cost so on and so forth are across this entire pyramidal structure so so that's okay. how we went about doing the research uh, shakti that's great uh, any ballpark figure as to how many data points were looked into analyzed uh, in order to prepare this report uh, I remember the other day you said maybe hundreds of thousands or millions. I'm not sure if you were actually uh, joking or you are serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Serious, serious business now. Yeah, game face on. Yeah. So Shakti, uh, we took into factor about 30. That's 30 to roughly about 140 data points per category. Right. So I would say ballpark about. 10,000 to 20,000 data points roughly together, which went into this analysis. And I think it's important to understand what are those data points which go in and some of the data points which actually went into the calculation of understanding what is the future prediction of category softness in fiscal 2021, 2022. Some of the key data points which went into the data lake or the data hub, as we call it, uh, are basically costs, cost drivers, margins, pricing, supply, demand, supply, demand deltas, market competition, which encompasses your negotiation power, rivalry within the industry, supplier power, buyer power, all the substitutes which go into that particular category. And every underlying negotiation lever element was basically taken into consideration before building the parametric model. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Vail. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so we, here we have an example output from the report. Uh, I believe this is one of the first slides that appears in the report. Uh, I can see a lot of green dots, lead dots, uh, you know, with needles sticking in. Um, so if I am the category manager, uh, how do I interpret this? How do I read this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the intent is to give category managers pins and needles by actually looking at this particular slide. But let me let me give an interpretation of how to take a look at this. I'll start I'll start with the short view and then I'll get into details over the next two minutes if you don't mind, Shakti. So it's quite simple. Any categories moving into the red zone in the middle is basically uh, bad news. Any category moving towards the outer beige zone, the beige does not show very clearly because it's under a white background. Yeah. But just yeah. imagine the outer circle or the or the concentric circle outside is basically mm -hmm. the beige zone. So the beige zone is your end zone or your goalpost, and you want to make sure that categories move towards the beige zone, right? So think of it as a black hole or a hot plate in the middle or or the mantle, and you want to make sure that categories don't get sucked into a vortex of the middle, which is the black okay. hole, because of gravitational forces or, or category related forces, you want them pushed out, like literally going on a carousal on the base zone. So uh, categories need to stay on the base zone for you to adapt the category towards your category management practices. 
Yeah, well, there is uh, some nice reference to nuclear physics uh, over there. Uh, just explain to me um, in which direction it's moving, because I see red and green. Uh, and, and then you said the categories needs to be in the beige band, that is the outer band, which unfortunately it's not visible because of the contrast. Uh, but I don't see any of the categories in the beige band. I, I believe it could be because of the disruption brought about by uh, this pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. I, I'm just guessing. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, can you please explain to me in which direction it's flowing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Shakti. So the center red hot molten lava is basically where you don't want to set foot on, literally like the game. And I call it the region of uncertainty. So the center circle is the region of uncertainty and outside is basically the region of adaptability where you basically adapt your supply strategy, sourcing strategy, category management practices to make sure that you basically run the category and the category does not run you. You see most of the categories in the yellow zone, right? You could call it the transition zone or a neutral zone, or you can actually call it a zone of stability, right? So the important point to understand is that as of um, April 2021, 95% of categories across most industries are in the neutral zone or the stable zone. So I would not be overly worried if I was a CPO or a category director or a category manager. What I'd actually keep my eyes on and keep my ears open towards is what is the direction in which the red and green dots are moving mm, and okay. what's the velocity of distance traveled between the two dots, right? So you don't want to be inching towards the center. The red dots are the most recent data point. The green circles or dots are from the previous quarter, right? So you'd want the red dots to be moving towards the beige zone or outside, right? So just to get into specifics, chemicals as a cluster, you see the red zone moving towards, for example, the region of uncertainty, right? You see that in mining, you see that in marketing services, you see that in employee benefits, and in fact, in employee benefits, just so that everybody can quickly view what I'm what I'm referencing, it's at the seven o'clock position. So seven o'clock position, employee benefit services, freight services, roughly at the nine o'clock position, chemicals at the twelve o'clock position. You see the red dot, which yeah. is the most recent set of data points moving towards the region of uncertainty. And in areas like employee benefits, you see the distance between the green dot and the red dot. Uh, wider than most other yeah. categories. Yeah, so so uh, you want to make sure that you're moving towards the beige zone and you want to make sure that the categories are uh, not spaced out with such great distance between them, unless it's moving to the beige zone, but definitely not towards the core. Okay. So in essence, Shakti, net net summary is it calculates how soft your category is going to look like for the next 12 months. How difficult is sourcing, contracting, RFPs, managing categories, SRM practices, controlling price, hitting my scorecards, cost savings, cost avoidance targets? How does that look like for the next 12 months is exactly what it showcases right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vail. Uh, next slide, please. So we have another uh, example output here. Uh, it's a dashboard. So we have an extract from the chemicals cluster. So I, as I had mentioned previously, you know, we'll, we are having some 300 plus dashboards in the report, and this is a typical dashboard. Uh, once again, how do I interpret this uh, from a procurement manager perspective? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Shakti. So before I jump into chemicals, I just want uh, the audience to understand that we've got 19 clusters, 53 portfolios, and 389 categories for which we have mathematical outputs across the four columns, which you can actually see on front of your screens right now. Number one, what's the price looking like for the next quarter? How are input costs going to change for the next quarter? How is supply demand gap gonna look like for the next quarter? And for anybody who's managing indirect categories, look at it as demand because supply is fairly elastic in indirect categories. And then how are market competition forces gonna shape up over the next quarter? So that's the way I would look at it. And we've done this analysis for everything from chemicals to metals, to agro products, to pharma R&D, to 
uh, professional services to freight services, pretty much any category you can imagine under the sun. And what you're looking at is a sample for chemicals. And like I said, we've done this for all of the 19 clusters, the 53 portfolios, and also the 389 categories. So coming into the specifics on what you can actually see on your screen right now, chemicals has been broken down into multiple uh, portfolios, bulk chemicals, elastomers, fertilizers, industrial acids, pigments, resins, silicones, solvents, surfactants. And if you go one level down, you'll find out that surfactants is broken down into LAB, LAS, AOS, so on and so forth. Uh, acids would be broken down into sulfuric acid, so on and so forth. So we've got that entire breakdown, which basically rolls up into the calculations which you're seeing on your screen right now. You don't want to see any reds on your screen. If you see a red, it basically means there is a movement of greater than 3% on each one of those factors. If price goes up by more than 3% in terms of predictions for the next quarter, you see a red. If input cost goes up by 3% or more, you see a red against input cost. If supply demand, the gap becomes higher, and here the reference to supply demand is on the side which makes it difficult for procurement, where there is tight supply and increased demand, which is, which is, which is basically category hardness, you'd see a red, and luckily you don't see a red for chemicals on that particular space. Similarly with market competition, if you don't see a fair balanced commoditized market, and if you see cartelization or monopolization or larger levels of divestures or plant closures, shutdowns, turnarounds, so on and so forth, then your market competition score basically goes into the red, which is the zone of hardness. And luckily when, uh, for anybody out there who's managing chemicals as a large cluster, you don't see that for the next quarter. It's predominantly price index and input cost index, which is basically going up across multiple categories in the chemical space. Okay, uh, just a thought occurred to me, uh, Vail, uh, before we move on to the next slide. Uh, does this qualify as market intelligence? That is procurement base book. Does it qualify as market intelligence? Why I'm asking this question is there's a larger theme as to how can procurement effectively make use of market intelligence, the various outputs that uh, a company like us provide, for example, there are other service providers also out there. But in general, uh, is this market intelligence? And if yes, uh, how can they make use of it? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's important to basically segue this into any findings which we're going to go in at a at a cluster portfolio and a category level. And I think I think at this this particular point of time, it's important to level set uh, the baseline as to what this actually means. What do we even do with this data, right? So short answer, Shakti, is yes, this qualifies as market intel. I think the longer or the long-winded answer right now will be on. How do I use this uh, to yeah. make informed sourcing decisions, right? Number one, you could actually input this data into your spend analysis sheets to understand whether your spend baselines are competitive. Number two, you could use these inputs into your savings tracking program, into your category or procurement manager or sourcing manager scorecards to understand whether you're hitting what is allowable or achievable in terms of cost savings, cost avoidance, uh, and benchmarks of that nature. Number three, you can actually plug this into your um, budgeting for the next quarter, especially in the commodity space where you're seeing a lot of volatility and you wanna understand is the category going to deflate? Is it gonna inflate the next quarter so that I can actually adjust my budgets accordingly, especially in the chemicals, metals, agro, pharma space. Uh, you could actually use it as inputs into those. and this basically qualifies as market intelligence or a key integral part of my uh, market intelligence playbook at a, at, a, at a category level, at a portfolio level and a cluster level, okay. because it gives you price forecasts, it gives you price evolution, it gives you historic pricing, it gives you cost structures, it also gives you any very specific market tightness parameters, and it also helps me understand how the supply market is structured new suppliers, innovative suppliers, market shares of suppliers, and all of these data points go into these calculations. And hence, it gives you a good view of um, uh, strategic sourcing and market intelligence, which actually supports it. So short answer, yes, it does qualify as market intelligence. Uh, cool, thank you, Will. Uh, dear audience, if you have any question relating to either price, cost, or supply demand, 
or on suppliers, benchmarking, uh, best practices, KPI, uh, anything relating to uh, sourcing, uh, sourcing Intel, please feel free to key in your questions. We will uh, take up your questions once we are done with our discussion, uh, hopefully in another 20 minutes. Uh, just in case, if we are unable to take up your question during the event, we will certainly try and answer them via email. So please don't feel shy. Go ahead and post your questions. We would love to hear from you. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Let's move on. Okay. Now, the key takeaways. Uh, so, as we previously uh, showed, there are three levels: a cluster level. We are just calling it macro level for uh, for the audience benefit, especially those who are new, those who have not seen the base book before, and and there is this portfolio level and the category level. So let's start with macro level quickly. Well, uh, it's very self-explanatory. Looks like conditions are worse than marginally for these three uh, categories. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll hit on the highlights, uh, Shakti. Chemicals, when you look at a cluster level, six out of nine are basically worsening. Three of them remain stable. All the night nine portfolios within chemicals however is very important to remember this fall into the neutral band which means price input costs have increased but at the same time your portfolios like elastomers fertilizers pigments resins solvents surfactants are actually looking at a stable supply demand situation and a market competition situation basically an end recommendation for chemicals is supply demand situation is neutral to favorable across all portfolios which basically means there will be softening in the future. So that's the point to remember. Chemicals 2021, good outlook. Similarly, mining conditions deteriorated slightly in the mining cluster. Most of the portfolios witnessed a marginal worsening through sourcing conditions. However, price movements and input cost movements have been fairly unfavorable across equipment, consumables, services. Supply demand situation and market competition are neutral, very similar to uh, the chemicals examples which I gave you. Uh, no improvement is anticipated in equipment categories, but there is a favorable supply demand situation and market competition, which could lead to improved conditions across volatile categories like consumables and services uh, in the mining cluster. So positive outlook from H2 2021 for mining, until then there is gonna be a little bit of a tight supply situation. And then marketing services, there is a massive demand due to adverse sourcing conditions and market conditions because of COVID and how the retail industry is basically using these categories, but it is set to improve later in 2021. But until then, there is a little bit of a, a hardening of the market for marketing services too. Okay, uh, that's good. Uh, next slide, please. Again, very self-explanatory looks like engineering and construction and staffing services the conditions that is the sourcing conditions are favorable yeah yeah absolutely so if i was i was a category manager for engineering and construction and when i say engineering and construction uh it's, it's got multiple ways you can look at it you can look at it as project management you can look at it as commissioning decommissioning you could look at it as flooring lighting so this, there's a bunch of categories which fall under engineering and construction but i would be really happy if i was sourcing engineering and construction in fiscal 2021 22 stable favorable conditions and uh price input costs are basically quite low right now but having said that uh not too much of uh not too much of this situation uh, i think moving into 2021 you will see a little bit of worsening but it will still stay as a very stable category similarly staffing it ties well into engineering and construction so there is surplus right now so there is negotiation leverage from a buyer side but moving forward as as soon as more projects come online as soon as there's a little bit more organization of union labor there will be uh, a, a worsening of this situation and when i say worsening it will move away from uh, let's call it the happy zone or the adaptable zone into more of the neutral or the stable zone so it looks fantastic right now might get a little difficult to source moving forward this year okay uh, i think we are done with the highlights at the cluster level uh, next slide please i think we are now moving on to the portfolio level, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are now at the portfolio level and there are five portfolios uh, listed here. Um, looks like the price and the input input cost index is unfavorable, but the supply demand index is stable. Uh, can you please explain uh, what's happening here? Any highlights? 
Any... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll hit on the highlight, Shakti. So this is what I, I call as the traditional uh, stable zone or the orange zone or the neutral zone. And what's important is to understand, is it going to become adaptable or is it going to become uncertain, right? So I'll start with chemicals. Um, essentially, it's adverse sourcing conditions currently because of price increase in categories like natural rubber for obvious reasons as to it goes into PPE, so on and so forth. And we're talking about 2020, 2021, and you've, got, you've, you've seen a price increase over there. Similarly with benzene, methanol, polyvinyl chloride, resin, so on and so forth. But conditions, for example, in industrial acids and bulk chemicals portfolios have stayed neutral. So essentially a uh, tough category to source right now, but things will actually let up uh, further this year. Similarly with metals and minerals, Conditions improved significantly in metals and minerals with most of the portfolios experiencing improving sourcing conditions. Uh, just to give an example, price movement and input cost movements are very unfavorable across base metals and ferrous metals right now for obvious reasons that prices are going to go up. But unfavorable price and input cost conditions have been continuing for the past few quarters. It's, it's not new, but it could threaten a pull towards more unfavorable conditions but supply demand market competition quite balanced highly favorable there will be mild softening and that's very critical to understand for metals and minerals there will be mild softening if these conditions are uh, tied along let's say over the subsequent few quarters so positive outlook for metals and minerals moving forward into 2021 2022 and uh, a quick uh, update on agro categories uh, when you look at agro commodities nine out of ten experienced improved sourcing conditions which is fantastic news for anybody in the CPG, food and beverage business, uh, people who belong to that industry and are sourcing these categories. Uh, all of these categories are in the neutral band, but portfolios like cereals, grains, dairy, sweeteners, fruits and vegetables are experiencing a little bit of unfavorable price and input cost movement. Uh, but again, the good news is that supply demand situation and market competition will continue to be neutral and favorable across these portfolios uh, across fiscal 2021-2022. So uh, agro commodities, uh, you could go in for the long game and long drawn out contracts further this year. So that's that's a quick summary on uh, the agro categories too. Okay, uh, uh, next slide. I think you covered uh, some of the uh, portfolios in the next category, uh, next slide. Yeah, here it is, yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to add on this uh, slide, uh, Will? Because you covered no, agro commodities. So, yeah, so both of the slides which we just uh, saw, Shakti, are a continuation of okay. this particular uh, uh, zone, which we call as the unfavorable price and input costs, but supply demand is stable. So it's a continuation of uh, the previous one. So we can actually skip into the next zone. Sure. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here uh, we have about eight portfolios. Uh, it says sourcing conditions are mildly positive. So what is mildly positive? Yeah, yeah. So since we've got a lot of categories, I'll, I'll stick to, uh, I think, the, the theory or, or the crux behind how these category uh, categories are basically uh, bucketed as mildly positive. So if you visualize these categories, portfolios, and clusters um, in three different bands across favorability in sourcing, uh, the ones in the outermost band would have the most favorable conditions, right? So when you look at this particular category list, what you see over here is that the conditions are stable across all four parameters. Minor fluctuations in any one of these parameters is possible, but as such conditions are basically mildly positive, which basically means it indicates a slightly favorable environment, not overtly so. It will stay in the uh, safe zone, the secure zone, and categories like, for example, industrial manufacturing, which covers most of your industrial processes, mechanical components, equipment, packaging, pulp, paper, corrugated boards, uh, some of your engineering and construction categories, very specific to the oil and gas space, for example, ENP, exploration and production, some of your energy categories, right, uh, especially in the renewable energy portfolio will all continue to stay in the neutral band. So that's that's a summary of this set of categories, Shakti. Okay, uh, I was talking to our research colleagues last week, uh, Vail, and a very interesting uh, nugget they told me that apparently the United States, the US, uh, you know, it, it may witness a severe shortage of truck drivers by the year 2026. I mean, that just came out of nowhere and they were just telling me it was part of a uh, a report that they did for one of our clients. Uh, why I'm asking this question is, would the beige book, uh, would it 
uh, capture such undercurrents, uh, you know, such large trends, the undercurrents that may perhaps play out in the next two to three years? Absolutely, absolutely, Shakti. So I think the beige book captures any uh, non-steady state changes out there in the marketplace, right? Uh, it could be a shutdown of a chemical plant in Texas. It could be the IC winter storm and what kind of an effect did it have, right? So it could be, uh, for example, HS codes, which are going to be moved from eight to 10 digits, literally, I think as of today or something like that, uh, in, in, in any of the ports in and around the Gulf of Mexico, right? So it captures all of the future trends. So the point is it's cognitive in terms of its predictability of what's gonna change in each one of the categories. Coming back to your question on freight, logistics, warehousing, 3PLs, 4PLs, freight forwarders, so on and so forth. Overall, as a cluster, when you look at freight and transportation as, as, as the apex cluster, there's, there's a lot of hardness in the marketplace, right? And it's not being contributed by global air freight. It's not being contributed by, for example, ocean. Those are categories which are softening. Like you rightly said, it's being contributed by two categories, which is your reefer freight right, mm -hmm. which is refrigerated road freight, and also on your regular road freight, which is basically un, uh, not temperature controlled. And like you rightly said, there is tightness in terms of drivers. There's also tightness in terms of supply capacities, number of trucks. There's also tightness in terms of your load to weight ratio. And load to weight ratio is the metric which is used to understand what the capacities are in this particular marketplace. And from mm -hmm. my understanding, talking to some of the world's largest suppliers in this particular space is that there's a lot of capacity addition which is actually going on currently to basically ease the tightening of the marketplace. So even though I started off by saying that road freight, uh, especially uh, reefer and uh, not temperature controlled categories are facing tightness, which is basically market hardness, that's expected to ease out uh, in the rest of 2021, 2022 too. So absolutely, yes, this is an observation which our numbers are showing currently. Okay, uh, just a quick question, maybe an S or no, uh, before we move on. Does Beige Book cover uh, supplier financials? That is, uh, any alarm uh, mechanism that is that built in so that procurement managers will know that maybe financials are deteriorating? Yes, no? Uh, no, Shakti, it does not. It does not. It okay. does not capture the financials of suppliers. No, we've not built it into this particular algorithm. We have not. All right. Okay. Uh, let's move on, please. Okay. We are still at the portfolio level. Uh, very quickly, Vail, there are six portfolios and looks like the sourcing conditions are favorable. So what can procurement managers uh, working in these portfolios can expect? What to expect? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is predominantly driven by a lot of the pharma R&D categories, right? So category conditions have definitely improved marginally at the pharma R&D cluster level, like CROs, lab services, drug manufacturing services, pharma materials, formulations, some of these portfolios remain neutral with price, cost, supply demand, market competition, continuing to be neutral in each one of these categories. Uh, market competition improved and other indices remain stable for medical equipment and supplies. So what happens is net-net, we've actually built a system where your stack ranking spend contributed to each one of these categories. Just to give you an example, I wouldn't look at uh, pharma materials the same way I look at for example, lab consumables. I know I spend more on pharma materials compared to lab consumables. So what we've done is we've done a spend distribution by finding out what is the impact on my overall portfolio and cluster. And based on the weight allocation, we've seen that there could be continued pressure in about three or five portfolios in the immediate future. But overall, it's a very neutral set of categories, which means you could negotiate, you could leverage, you could contract, you could push prices down. But farm R&D is not about pushing prices down. It's more about speed to market. It's more about securing supply. It's more about making sure that all your SLAs and KPIs are in place. And now's a good time to be able to do so. So that's the outcome of favorable sourcing conditions. Okay, so we are, we are receiving uh, quite a few questions from the audience. So perhaps we we can just uh, maybe rush, rush a bit. Uh, we'll go to the category level, please. Next one. Yeah, so I think the first principles are the same, right, Vail, uh, be it at the cluster level or the portfolio level. Uh, sourcing conditions are hard at these individual category levels. Uh, any highlights here or do you want to uh, move forward? Yeah, so I'll do the highlight reel. Um, yeah. Where the conditions are hard, which is basically the unfavorable one. If any of you are sourcing polystyrene, benzene, uh, tin, mm, ocean freight, learning and development, 
that's going to be difficult. If NFP was sourcing the following, which I'm about to list, conditions are favorable, sulfuric acid, lime, almonds, cashew nuts, menthol, tallow, or pretty much any of your agro, MRO, engineering and design categories and your packaging categories, you've got a good outlook. Um, and then what are, what are the other key specifics I wanted to talk about? Uh, improvement, where you'll actually see the categories relaxing and higher level of uh, softness would be your PETs, ethylene glycol, uh, xylene, soda ash, ethyl acetate, molybdenum, refractories, uh, if anybody is doing that, uh, vanillin, yeast, soybean, beef, some of these will actually see massive levels of improvement in the following months in 2021, 2022. Uh, that's a very quick highlight, Shakti, on where sourcing conditions are hard. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, well, we have uh, a whole bunch of categories here where apparently the sourcing conditions are favorable. Uh, do you want to pick a favorite? I, I can see salmon and shrimp. It's dinner time here in India. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll probably club that with everything else, Shakti, considering we're running out of time. So I'm, yeah. I'm going to combine this with the next set, which is basically categories which are improving. So mm -hmm. net net, any any categories or, or rather the categories which you can see right now are categories where there is an imminent fall in price or input costs or increased supply, reduced demand, enhanced market competition, or a combination of any of these, which basically gives you leverage as a buyer out there in the marketplace. So the categories which you see right now are categories which uh, are, are easy, or, or uh, I shouldn't say easy, or relatively optimal to be able to hit any kind of competitive buying uh, scorecard targets uh, than many other categories. Okay. Um... We still have a couple of more slides before we open up for uh, audience Q and A. But however, well, I think this one question is very pertinent. I think uh, I'm 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 going to take it up even before we formally open it up for audience Q and A. So this question is from uh, Ricardo Medrano. Uh, so he's asking: Is all this information updated as of Q4 2020 or Q1 2021? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... We have information until, uh, I would say, 12 months later, which is basically all the way till the end of 2021, which means there's a predictive analytics built into it. So it gives you all the numbers forward looking to. In terms of historic numbers, which were used to do the forecasts, to do everything which I spoke about right now, it's dated as of December 31st, 2020. So we got the data released in the month of March, which means we calculated it until December 2020. And those have been used for the forecast. And next month, we'll actually update it for Q1 also. So, so that's what it is. So you'll be publishing this report every quarter. And you've been doing it for the past two, three years, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Shakti, we are moving into a little bit more of a higher refresh model where we probably okay. might start doing this every 45 days instead of uh, the current model. We have been doing it every 100 and, um, uh, 100 and, or 90 days. So. So we might have the frequency in which we release it right now. Okay, is it is it automated well? Because I believe you are working on a project where uh, you wanted to automate it all on the new platform, right? The barrellive.ai. Yeah, absolutely. So is it automated, automated or would you be just uploading this report as such uh, for our clients? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Shakti, I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier. My apologies. No, no, please go on. Uh, go on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, the answer is our investments in AI is basically enabling us to do this faster. So all of the inputs, for example, benchmarks from peers and competitors, uh, third-party data from, uh, for example, best-in-class data partners, all of the information which goes into the underlying fundamental calculations and the forecasting, as you said, has been automated by Bero through our digitalization initiatives, especially okay. through the very, very cognitive Live.ai platform, through our AI technologies, machine learning, NLP, NLU, so on and so forth. And hence, we're able to cut down the speed at which we basically, or not cut down the speed, sorry, cut down the time which we take to release this. And hence, we'll be doing it every 45 days. Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. And you'll, you'll be uploading it on the platform. Yeah, it'll be available on the platform. Users can actually uh, work with Bero to get access to the platform and they can, they can view the content on platform. Okay, uh, cool. So let's move on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we have another term here, uh, improving conditions. Uh, Q4 2020 versus Q2, basically sequentially, uh, these eight categories, improving conditions. Any 
any highlights here or any takeaways? Yeah, yeah. So some of these categories were already discussed in the previous six different scenarios. This is basically the distillate of all of these. These are the categories where uh, you're seeing a turnaround, right? Uh, previous quarter where it was hardening, you see a sudden switch over and then these are categories which have become softening. So you can think of these as categories which have crossed a inflection point where it's moving into softness and away from hardness. So th these are those categories, Shafi. Okay. Uh next slide please okay i think before before we uh before i formally open up uh for the audience q a uh, just one question uh, it occurred to me now uh, way you know uh how is this beige book uh i mean now that we have seen the key takeaways at three levels that is at the macro slash cluster level portfolio level and the category level so how is the beige book useful for a cpo vp director and category managers i'm uh, specifically asking this question because you know there is a hierarchy in the procurement organizations and how each level can make use of this report yeah absolutely and it was intentionally designed to hit across three different hierarchies within a procurement organization shakti cpos and then category directors or regional directors some some people are pivoted towards regions some people are pivoted towards categories and then you have the category managers who could be global regional and um, let's say local right uh, cpos are interested in understanding uh, SPIN baselines, COGS baselines, COGS baselines, SGNA baselines, and also understanding overall how, how, how difficult is it to be able to hit, for example, targets which have been agreed upon with finance. Those inputs come in at a cluster level. So those are the inputs which we are giving at a chemicals level, so on and so forth. So they understand which are the areas which are going to be difficult, which are the areas which are going to be fairly easy right and hence how do i put extra investments in certain areas so on and so forth right so that's at cpo level at a category director level what we've done is we've given a regional input right so anybody who gets access to the 400 slide uh beige book uh whoever's eligible for that commercially will actually notice that there are inputs at a regional level also how is north america behaving how is afac behaving how is emea behaving how's latin america behaving how's western europe behaving so on and so forth so they can actually make decisions at a regional level to understand which categories should be clubbed with which geographies, right? How do I how do I build out my sourcing strategy so that I understand where do I put more resources, which region, so on and so forth. And at the category manager level, I think we've discussed that maybe multiple times. It's all about price. It's all about negotiation leverage. It's all about who the top suppliers are, how the supply market is changing. It's all about SLAs, KPIs, what's tightening. It's all about what's happening in the market industry and market trend wise, and the Facebook captures those for all of the categories. Okay, thank you. Thanks much, Vail, for patiently answering my question. So we are uh, we are now proceeding with the audience Q and A. Uh, I think the first one is from Steve Garachi. Uh, looks like it's more of a comment or a question. I'm not sure, uh, but here is the message. I am interested in healthcare business intelligence data, strategy levers to build into strategy so I, I think what steve is looking for is uh, business intelligence data to build strategy in the healthcare sector and he is also looking for marketing category digital levers uh, yeah so i think it's more i think it's more of a comment uh, steve we will uh, get in touch with you uh, via email uh, to answer uh, your question uh, next one is from ronit uh, goodman what is the best way to define cost reduction target in percentage uh, for next year in electronic slash mechanics high tech component? Uh, yeah. Is it yeah, something so that you could take up now or? Yeah, no, I think we can actually answer most of these questions. Uh, Shakti, I'll probably answer Mr. Garachi's question also and also the current question. Uh, okay. So, any questions on digital marketing levers, any questions, uh, are not, not questions, how can Vero help or anything around business intelligence input, so on and so forth. We've got access to a lot of repository in, on the Vero uh, category IP um, um, Shakti. So we can definitely get in touch with them and we can sure. talk about what we have and we could exchange thoughts over email and then we can see how we take it forward. But coming back to the question on this particular industry, on, on, on the electronics industry, um, yeah. What I remember is I, we have we have this data, and I think those those data points went into some of these calculations. So what I'd like to know, Shakti, is 
do we get a list of these questions? We wouldn't lose it at the end of the webinar, right? So we should be able to. Yeah, yeah. So some of the quick inputs like this particular question on, on electronics components, so on and so forth. I think it's as simple as sending out uh, how the calculations are done for cost savings, cost avoidance, what's the baseline? Um, is it on a ZBB? Is it based on inflation or is it without counting inflation? Is it is it after including inventory or before including inventory? So there are many ways in which these calculations are built out. Uh, I'd be very happy to send across short answers like this directly to him, absolutely. Uh, maybe in a day or two. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Vail. Uh, we have a question, in fact, question and a comment uh, from Kevin Choi. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> I'm waiting to hear your answer. You mentioned categories such as HDPE, LDP, etc. Uh, conditions are improving. Mm -hmm. However, I'm encountering quite the opposite from my supplier base. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say, is there a lag in how the market condition is shaping out? Uh, versus when the impact trickles down to the end users. Uh, I think there's one more comment. If so, what sort of time lag uh, should we expect before we see relief? Um, so he feels the conditions are hard. Uh, do, do you want to refer yeah. to your notes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I remember this because I manage a lot of the chemicals portfolios, uh, Shakti, okay. so I wouldn't need to refer to the notes. Yeah, but let me okay. give a very direct answer to this particular question. Yes, there is a time lag between where market conditions harden. And I think we spoke about HDPE, and it's not just HDPE, it's about, uh, I'm not too sure uh, which are the other categories which uh, they, uh, this gentleman um, uh, sources, but across resins right so let's say we're looking at resins which is your hdps ldps lldp so on and so forth there is a weakened demand which was there in q4 2020 and then resin prices are continuing to rise just to kind of uh, level set what we spoke about earlier right the demand is expected to be soft due to covid 19 i think i think that's the reference which came in and same with bulk chemicals right for example if you pick caustic soda there is a steady supply and there's a low demand scenario but there is a time lag of a quarter in which there will be a correction of the marketplace. It could be because there's an increase in demand for hand wash soaps, right? It could be because Italy, Spain, UK, and Germany are basically reducing manufacturing activities, but then demand will actually pick up in the coming few months. Same with elastomers, right? If you look at NR grades, when I say NR, I mean natural rubber, SMR20, SAR20, prices could decline because downstream activities from automotive tires, so on and so forth, remain muted, right? So just to get into, get into specifics, uh, Shakti, which category was the reference? HDP, is it? High density HDP, polyethylene. LDP, and so yeah. on. So you had mentioned HDP and LDP. Yeah, so let's say HDP, LDP goes into caps, closures, bottles, packaging equipment, uh, primary packaging, so on and so forth. One of, the, one of the data points which I have access to basically shows tightening of market conditions between just to be very specific december 2020 all the way until may 2021 which is basically for another month and then i see a lot of stability in terms of pricing price drivers and feedstock essentially you're looking at ethylene as a feedstock right and just to be very specific ethylene outlook is a six to eight in percent increase in the us zero to one percent in europe and Asia 11 to 14 percent. So I might be wrong, but my I would put my money saying that the sourcing is happening in the US or in Asia, not in Europe. Maybe we need to look at other geographies outside of uh, US and Asia, if possible. It's a commodity, so it might not be as easy to switch. But net net, US prices, Asia prices, LATAM prices, Europe prices, May 2021 all the way till December 2021, we'll see a small decline or stability and hence there's a one quarter lag and you will see softening of HDP, LDP prices towards the end of this year. We'd be very happy to send some high level forecasts uh, to the person who asked this question. Okay, so you can expect the relief, some relief uh, month of August, September? In, in, uh, even earlier than that. Uh, even we're, talking earlier than as, that. Yeah, we're talking as early as 60 days from now till the end of this year, essentially because of ethylene prices, which is the predominant cost driver, which, which yeah. Uh, they would definitely know. Cool. Uh, so from HDP, let's move on to agro commodities, uh, Wayne. Uh, this question is from Vishal Kalia. 
for agro commodities are you expecting supply demand to stabilize uh, even though when the economy fully opens up in north america in the second half of uh, 2021 mm -hmm. and then he goes on to add hopefully adding more pressure on demand uh, yeah sure sure so agro is a very large portfolio shakti right so i'll i'll, I'll tell whatever i know and remember right and uh, i just hope it uh, it helps in the question which uh, the, the gentleman asked so cereals and grains prices are going to go down in the next 6 months because of drop in feed demand that's my that's my direct view of what i've seen working with a, a lot of clients in the cpg space food and beverage space dairy will remain volatile we're talking about liquid milk supply especially is going to reduce in the oceania space when i say oceania i meant the region due to bad mm -hmm. weather which will increase prices sweeteners and when i say sweeteners uh, uh hfcs um uh, uh sorbitol mannitol xylitol prices i see some level of increases right and so the substitutes and the and the core product work in a uh, opposite manner like a alice in wonderland paradox so when i say one will increase it means that then the other will decrease then the other decreases the other will increase so it will kind of work in a twinning way right and in terms of fruits and vegetables and here the reference is strawberries oranges so on and so forth despite fundamentals panic buying across most countries have inflated the prices so net net what i've seen is there is reduced supply price volatility for a lot of agro products grains neutral outlook is what is what i have seen okay uh, great so now this is another interesting question from Frank Shimansky. I, I know we addressed the electronic components uh, previously, but then I think this uh, this is much more clearer. Uh, interesting show of trend, mildly positive for electronic components vis-a-vis -vis the global chip shortage crisis. You know the semiconductors uh, over uh, demand on foundry level, increasing prices, etc. So basically, he's asking uh, which positive trends. Uh, next to the investments in US, China, Korea, do you see to counter this trend? So basically, he's looking, I think he's surprised that uh, you know, how can electronics be mildly positive uh, when there is, the world is experiencing chip shortage? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Shakti. And I think it's a very important question to address, and we can get into uh, specifics through a separate interaction. So, Shakti, the way in which the market softness or the market hardness is basically being defined is not only looking at pricing, right? So price is not the only indicator. It's it's one amongst many indicators of how categories are looked into. Absolutely, okay. chip shortage, uh, China, PV, understand how that entire uh, marketplace mm -hmm. works. And this is not just for uh, electronic components alone. This also includes uh, forgings, castings, um, uh, metal fabrication, uh, sand castings, switch gears, transformers, DIN rails, batteries, PCBs, industrial motors, cables, cable harnesses, active components, passive components, connectors, EMS as a service, so on and so forth. So the overall reference is market conditions becoming favorable. The overall point over here was it is going to become a little bit easier as the quarters pass by to be able to secure supply in this particular category, right? Price could be a totally different ball game where we'll have to understand which grades, which products, uh, which suppliers are they buying from to understand what it is and yes it is absolute common knowledge that prices are increasing in most categories in the world not just only on chips but we should get into specifics it's a fantastic question i think we should connect with him offline and take this conversation sure. forward sure sure uh this another question from andrew donnelly uh, base oils are in critical short supply globally uh, but especially in europe uh, when do you see this situation changing? So it looks like base oil, the category conditions, uh, sourcing conditions are very bad. Uh, any hint, whale, uh, when it will become better? Yeah, so base oils, uh, I, I want to be very transparent about it. Uh, my understanding of base oils, and when I say base oils, I'm definitely not referring to commoditized ones like diesel, oil, so on and so forth. I'm talking about blended uh, oils, for example, from a Total, or from a shell or from a chevron right they tend to uh, be very specific towards uh, the msds or what goes into the blend so on and so forth so it's a little difficult to understand because some of them are very patented products which just one person is making so on and so forth 
so uh, Shakti, I'll probably defer that answer to a later time and not uh, commit anything because I'd like to understand which product we're looking at or what formulation of base oil before being sure. able to uh, make that comment, if that's okay. But one of the things which I've noticed overall, if it helps, when you look at the downstream space in oil and gas, right? Not, not exploration and production, but the downstream space, for example, lubricants, greases, uh, industrial uh, air, so on and so forth. One of the things which we've seen is uh, H2 2021, there is a little bit of a correction in prices compared to the prices which were seen in December 2020, where there was massive shortage across some of these. But this is a very broad statement. We'll have to get into specifics. I've made a note of it and I'm going to get in touch with him after maybe a day or two. Okay, that's great. Uh... Next question is from Nitesh Shali. Any comment on beverage cans category? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and hey, hey, uh, Nitesh, I actually know who Nitesh is. Nitesh is. Uh, good to see you uh, on the webinar. Uh, so yeah, so we've got a standard pack which basically shows what beverage can uh, pricing outlook is, uh, Shakti. So I think it's as simple as just shipping it out to uh, Nitesh and getting in touch with him. So absolutely, yeah, we could do that. Okay, Andrew Donnelly just uh, clarified that he's looking at group one and group two base oils. So maybe okay. we can connect with them better. Yeah, Yeah, we could connect with them. No, that helps. Uh, saying that it's group one or group two is exactly what I was actually looking for. Uh, okay. Whatever we have uh, high level, we can definitely pass on to them. Absolutely. would love to have a conversation offline on this. Sure. Uh, next question is from Yogesh Deshpande. How would copper prices fair uh, over the next two quarters considering uh, it's been in the increasing trends for the past two quarters sure sure since we went into very specific pricing i'm trying to jog my memory not just on uh, copper but also on beverage cans because of uh, what uh, nitesh was asking uh, so nitesh as you already know beverage cans pretty much driven by lme aluminum price uh, focus and as you already know aluminum production has remained flat in the us europe very slow recovery demand from China has gone down because of the golden week holiday, which happened a few months back. So uh, prices will remain stable. I don't see a massive increase. I don't see a massive decrease. Uh, where you will see higher demand movement will be in North America and Europe, where you'll see stability, like I mentioned, is gonna be Europe and LATAM. But if you're looking for pointed pricing on what's 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 the uh, contract price, I think, I think we can definitely have that uh, connect uh, later. Uh, I know where to reach you. We can definitely do that, Nitesh. Uh, Shakti, what was the next question? I just want to make sure I remember the category, right? Did you say copper semis or did you say copper? Copper. Okay. Copper. Uh, what, what was the question under copper, Shakti? Uh, just uh, how would the copper prices perform over the next two quarters, considering it's been high over the past two quarters? The copper prices okay. are high. Yeah, that, I think that's yeah, what he's asking. So, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Copper prices are high. Um, I, I remember that it touched about, if I'm not wrong, uh, as high as about uh, $7,755 per metric ton in December 2020. And my reference over here is again LME uh, copper. So that would be copper and copper uh, semis. Uh, exact outlook pricing, I remember seeing some level of stability, Shakti. And the reference of stability is from the month of June 2021 which is uh, roughly about, what, two months away, all the way to October 2021. Beyond that, I don't know. So between okay. between uh, June 2021 to October 2021, I remember it hovering around the $7,650 per metric ton mark. But then we'll have to get into specifics because copper output is driven predominantly by weak supplies and strong demand uh, from Peru and Chile. So we'll, we'll really need to understand where the sourcing is happening, which industry the gentleman belongs to, uh, so sure. on and so forth. But yes, it has been a deficit market. There has been an increased demand globally, uh, especially in China because of downstream industries resuming operations. Uh, but visible stocks, LME, COMEX, SHFE, uh, decline has also been seen. But yeah, absolutely, uh, we can get into specific Shakti. But the answer is yes, it is seeing an all-time, uh, if not an all-time high, at least over the last two years, it's as high as it gets right now. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. Can you take one or two more questions? Well, we are continuing to receive questions. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Shakti. If I know the answer, absolutely yes. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> I'll 
to another time. Yeah, sure. Uh, for those of you who we are not able to answer it now, we will definitely answer over email. So please uh, continue to post your questions. This this one from Tayyub Ahmad uh, Ved. Um, so he's saying you mentioned that the paper and pulp conditions are positive, uh, but then he's asking, does the data show that the supply is stable globally? Uh, is there anything happening in the paper uh, pulp? Because I think he's, he has some doubts on the supply stability. Sure, sure, absolutely, Shakti. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what went into the analysis, right? So the overall analysis, basically, when we uh, ran it over the last three months, basically said there is. He is right in saying that we did say it's stable, right? So what we had seen was over the next two three months there was some level of stability, right? And uh, when we did the forecast, let's say for example in Feb or March, the reference was over March April, which was basically the two three months from when when we started doing the analysis. There was expected softness in demand, right? There, the pipeline was expected to be full, and ex and customers were expected to stop buying and start to destock. And destocking is one of the key determinants of whether there is going to be stability or volatility in the paper market, especially in cartons where paper is basically used as a feedstock from a normal level to a very very low level. So that's that's what I remember going into the analysis. Uh, exact pricing. Uh, whether whether we're looking at uh, receipt pricing or whether we're looking at some other uh, contract index, I think we could we could definitely go go into uh, specifics, uh, Shakti. But the answer is yes. Uh, the the prediction was uh, stability, right? Especially through U.S. paper manufacturers like Nine Dragons and Virgo and Sapphire and uh, Willamette, Lecta, so on and so forth. We we hardly saw anything more than a two percent uh, price in increase. And hence, we had actually said uh, uh, stability uh, based on material manufacturing and logistics costs. Okay, uh, one more question, Will. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Let's let's do one more. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, so perhaps this could be our final uh, question of the day. Uh, this is from Mohammad Azrul Zarisi Halim. Uh, what about industrial asset? Uh, market prices increased by 25% compared to Q1 2020 uh, when the supply and demand is expected to stabilize. You said Q1 yeah. 2020. I'm not sure if we meant 20, actually 2020 or 2021. Are you able to relate to that, Avail, the question? Uh, I wasn't able to relate to the category, Shakti. What is the name of the category again? Industrial what? Industrial acid. Oh, industrial acid. Okay, okay, absolutely. Okay. Sure. So, so, uh, so he he wanted to understand uh, when when is the supply and demand expected to stabilize for industrial asset? Okay. Um, so, the, is there any mention of which um, which asset is being referred to over here, uh, Shakti? Uh, is there a reference to, uh, for example, sulfuric acid or acetic acid, so on and so forth? I can answer for uh, sulfuric and acid. Uh, uh, um, you know what do you call it? Um, Acetic acid, if they, if that helps. HCL. So sulfuric acid. You just clarified. Uh, it's hydrochloric acid. What is HCl? Okay. Okay. So so acid stabilization uh, prices prediction I think will happen between October 2021 and December 2021, right? Uh, yeah. Which also means from July 2021, which is hardly about a quarter away, all the way until uh, even October 2021, which is more of a four month or a five month outlook there is actually going to be a sharp increase. Just to be very specific, there might be as high as a 15 to 16% increase. Stability will happen in only towards the last quarter of this particular calendar year, which is the third quarter of the fiscal. Until then, there will be a price increase uh, driven by Europe uh, prices. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Vail. Uh, we have received uh, several more questions, but unfortunately, uh, we are unable to answer all of them. But like uh, I said, uh, we will try and answer all those questions via email, so you will be hearing from us soon. Um, thank you so much, Vail, uh, for your uh, time. Uh, that was a very insightful session on how best uh, to make use of the Beige Book in real-life uh, sourcing situation. Uh, this marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today. Uh, uh, some of you had asked uh, whether we, will, you, will we be sharing the recording link? Yes, we will be sharing the uh, webinar recording link uh, with all our participants soon. Uh, please do reach out to the email address 
uh, on the screen if you have any additional questions. Uh, thank you and have a good day. And uh, Shakti, a big thanks to Madhavan and all the team leads for building out the beige book. So thanks, thanks guys. Yes, yes, indeed it's a team effort. So thank you team bureau for putting up this wonderful document. And this would be uploaded, uh, I think Monday or Tuesday next week, right? O onto the platform. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. This marks the end of our webinar. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good day. Yeah.